In one sense, all it is, is a conference uh, of invitation-only people attending. In another sense, it's probably one of the most influential bodies in the world. Established in 1954, um, European and American interests, the people who are involved in conspiracy theory thinking think it was there to generate wealth. It wasn't. It was there to prevent war. After the Second World War, fundamentally, the elite of Europe and, and the US wanted to ensure that the world would never have anything like it again. So it started in many ways for good reasons. In all that, there was also a protection of existing wealth. But it was not just conspiratorial, it was actually for social benefit, originally. Um, why the secrecy? Well, first of all, you've got about 120 people whom any terrorist would like to attack. So the secrecy here is largely because of the security, because you have some of the best brains in the world meeting. You have politicians, you have finance directors, you have CEOs, you have chairmen, you have people from the major banks. A catastrophe could occur if you actually allowed security to be lax. The secrecy is interesting. The secrecy, I think, began not to keep things secret, but to ensure that the people who attended the Bilderberg Conference felt relaxed. Whatever they said, they could say it. Nothing was going to be attributed. Nothing was going to be replicated externally. So really the Bilderberg Conference is a meeting of interests where people begin to reach some sort of consensus and share by feeling comfortable. Now, secrecy is not good. Lack of transparency is a problem. If, however, you made Bilderbergs too transparent, you would expose the conference to lobbying from different interests. Uh, you'd expose the conference to, in a sense, restricting conversation. So although you may get more transparency, ironically, you'd probably get another Bilderberg in the background growing up where people need to talk together in conference uh, and in confidence. Is this new? No. If you go to any board meeting, one of the most interesting things about a board meeting is the, the night before, where people get together, totally informal, they share their ideas, they share all the things that are difficult to discuss so that the board meeting the next day can proceed satisfactorily. So there is a function to the secrecy. It's not something I personally like, but I can see the logic of it. But the Bilderbergs are deeply influential in terms of creating something called a mindset, positioning a way of thinking, positioning an agenda, so that when it comes to the public domain, almost the press and the media don't know, how am I going to challenge this? But no decision is reached. Now, should you be worried? Bilderbergs is only one of a number of bodies like this, Trilateral Commission, Council of Foreign Relations, and a whole number in Europe, the UK, and the US. In one sense, yes, you should be worried. In another sense, it's very good that attention is being given to the Bilderbergs because at least people will begin to understand how, in a sense, the world's affairs are slowly being sorted out long before we get to a decision. So to understand the Bilderbergs, it's how we reach a way of thinking, and then somebody else, at some point down the line, will make a decision, like a government. In the world, there are two conflicting philosophies in many ways. Um, the first you can put under the heading of transactional capital. What that means is shareholder value. Really, the normal way an, a British or American company or Australian company is run. We have equities markets, you have debt markets. You try and go to the markets with some money, invest, pay the markets back. The reason it's called transactional capital is all that is short term. It's based on a transaction. And if you look at our life today, trying to invest and get rid of the poverty that we have, get rid of the uh, infrastructure concerns we have, you cannot use transactional capital. You have to have a much longer term point of view. So there's an alternative philosophy known as socialized capital, stakeholder capital, what the Germans have, in many ways what the Chinese have. And what you've really got is these two systems building up to have a clash. The Bilderbergs are undoubtedly championing transactional capital. And if you look at the way capital is actually allocated, the crash of 2008 made available resources and assets at a very cheap price, and they were snatched up. The fact that you and I may have suffered was one thing. The fact that more and more capital is being controlled by fewer and fewer people is another. So as you begin to look at the world's wars, at the world's deprivation and the world's concerns, in a sense, what these two philosophies are doing are positioning themselves to have a clash and become a one-world government. 
And in many ways, one of the Bilderberg aspirations is to create a one world government idea, but based on transactional capital. So are they doing a good job in determining how we're going to slowly progress to a one world government, a one world governance, a one world way of thinking? They're doing it brilliantly. The fact that on the way we have certain hiccups called a crash or certain deprivation, but in fact, as those crashes occur, transactional capital, shareholder value capital, begins to dominate the world, like you may have seen in the Middle East. Libya is gone. It's transactional capital. Iraq, in many ways, is gone. It's transactional capital. Um, slowly, we're building it into Asia. So what, in fact, is happening on a big policy scene is things are going to plan. On a daily scene, in terms of your life, uh, such as you and I, yes, we're having problems, but not in terms of uh, capital and not in terms of global policy. It's actually quite smart. You still have one problem. More and more people are getting poorer. Fewer and fewer people are getting richer. We're going to have food security as a concern. We're going to have water security as a concern. And I see no particular measures to invest to try and prevent those concerns. If you actually looked at fin financing our world in a completely different way, we could have basically twice the world's population and still have more food and more water than we actually need. What we have actually got is capital being used for short-term purposes as opposed to long-term investment. Go to Germany, you don't really have debt and equity markets. You borrow from the People's Bank. You have 25 to 35 year time horizons. We have three months time horizons. The city demands results in a quarter. Now how can you deal, for example, with um, housing deprivation in the UK on a three-month cycle. You can't. Are there any groups, any countries, any nations trying to champion the stakeholder capital viewpoint then? It seems as if we're overwhelmed by one particular viewpoint. We are overwhelmed by one viewpoint. Um, Germany is a very good example. It's got a, a very high level of profitability as a country. Uh, it's in surplus. Germany paid for the unification of East and West Germany. It's bailed out Europe. I know the Greeks don't have a happy time with Germany, but it's bailed out Greece. It's in many ways bailing out Italy and Spain and still have money to spare. Another country that's building itself up very fast and writing the laws and could well be the future nation of this earth is China. And there, their long-term investment patterns and the relationship between the state and finance to essentially build a country and an infrastructure that makes sense is taking place. True, China has problems, it has corruption problems, it has all sorts of concerns. But if you look at the development of China and the fast pace of growth and the fact that they're building an infrastructure for people and people like it, for example, in China, just over 22 million people are moved every year from the countryside to the cities. And it's something the Chinese people want, the standard of life is much better. But they're being moved about a thousand kilometers. So if you can imagine the whole population of Australia being moved from Australia to Singapore every year, with this plan continuing now for the next decade or more, and people want it, and people are clamoring for housing, you can see that there is quite a level of success. The problem is Germany, because Germany is caught up in many ways within the Bilderberg type of framework of thinking, and at the same time has a philosophy that contradicts the shareholder value capitalism. So it's going to be a very interesting development to see what happens to Germany in the sort of medium term future. I talked to two Bilderbergers, and both were deeply irritated with the conference. One called it a self-congratulating, irritating body of people who tell each other that they're beautiful. And the other person called it, uh, apart from one or two of the sessions, because they have conference sessions, uh, a waste of time. And what I did was I went to my room and I, I worked on my computer because I couldn't tolerate all this self-congratulatory nonsense. Just quickly, you say you, you mentioned that you spoke to two Bilderbergers. Can you reveal who they are or anything of any of the characters you know who've attended in the past? No. One of the reasons to, for the research to take place is we... Uh, ensured absolute confidentiality. So I can't even say which country they came from. Uh, and that was the only way that we could get people to talk to us. What I can say is we talked to quite a few people. Uh, it was in a whole number of countries. Um, the same basic message came through. The first is, on paper, the Bilderberg conference is innocent. People turn up to a conference, they listen to sessions, 
They meet people that they may unlikely to have met before because if you're a financier, you may meet other global financiers, but you probably won't meet somebody in manufacturing. Or you may not meet somebody who's running a major media company. So they enjoy the sessions, they enjoy the discussion, and they gain some sort of benefit themselves from being developed to look at the world in a different way, really get that global picture. It helps lift them up from their daily job. So reaching a consensus in many ways um, is exhilarating. And I can say that there is a benefit to that. The more the Bilderbergs meet, the more you get global elites together, in a sense you sort out issues before they get to a conflict. So one argument could be put forward, do the Bilderbergs in many ways sidestep wars that are unnecessary? The answer is yes. However, the lure of being such an elite body, in many ways the anxiety of never being invited again. We found two anxieties. The first anxiety for many of the Bilderbergers was, will I be invited? The second and worst anxiety is, will I be invited again? So that anxiety, in many ways, is leveraged. So once you have come to this sort of idea, let's say transactional capital is OK, and it's the best way to get entrepreneurialism going, and it's the best way to get an economy that's vibrant, without looking at the downside, in many ways, you've built a body of people now that you can rely on to sort of promote that view. Even the word promote is too strong, to just um, not go against it. And once you've done that, you now have a brilliant platform to move forward. Because press, media, manufacturing, uh, services, in many ways have got the whole mindset around recessions are okay, they're cyclical, um, things go up and down, but we can be resilient towards that. Instead of thinking, why don't we do things in a different way? Andrew, thank you so much. Um, extraordinary and fascinating. Thank you very much for joining us. My great pleasure. Thank you.